Right, what have we got to do? Boosh, it's a new thrower from Convoy, so I'm going to try and make this rapid because it doesn't have the most sort of uh, thorough UI. It's more straightforward, so hopefully this will be a quick review. So it's the Convoy M21E, and this is the box that it arrived in. Obviously, I have opened this because I've had to test this. I've carried this for two weeks now. Um, I've been on hikes, night hikes with it. I've been out early mornings, late at night, all over in city environments, in sort of um, fields and glades and, and all over the shop. This is, this is how it arrived. Now you'll notice there's no manual, which is a bit of annoying, but that's, that's a kind of a convoy thing. So no manual, no charging cable, because this is USB rechargeable, um, nothing but some bubble wrap. So if you've got a bit of stress, you can go, ooh, ah, ah, this, you know, if you're thinking about tints that you don't like on flashlights. So there's a little bit of stress relief. Right, boosh, get rid of that. Let's get on with the review. Stop messing about. Okay, so here's the light here. Um, and first off, I'll say, I quite like it. It's it's semi-compact. Obviously, it's certainly more compact than something like a huge dedicated thrower like the very popular Ashlux FT03. I mean, look at the, dis the sort of difference between that. This is pocketable. I found this pocketable in multiple coat pockets. Um, I had it in like a breast pocket. Just It just fitted in um, a tactical jacket that I've got, that sort of style. Um, I put it in dress pants, uh, jeans. Uh, if I'm sitting in a car, I had to sort of angle it, but it did fit um, because this is slightly larger um, than some of the other smaller ones. I mean, if you compare it to the GT Mini and the C8 Plus here from Convoy, um, you could argue that yeah, the heads are bigger, but the, the bodies are smaller because these are using an 18650, whereas this is using the larger 21700. So here's the 21700 that that's using. I tested it with the 40T from Samsung, and the rest of the time I used the, uh, I think it was a Molycell uh, P42A, and this has a capacity of 4,200 milliamp hours and a maximum continuous discharge, you can see there, of 30 amps. And it's the lithium ion, uh, flat top, had no problems. I picked this over the Samsung for the majority of the uh, usage because this is a tiny little bit shorter. And if you remember when I did the review of the Ace Beam E70, when I put this cell in and moved this around rapidly, um, it disengaged the circuit. So I thought, I, I, I want to make sure that this is, you know, resistant to that sort of issue and it was i didn't have any issues even when i bashed it around no problems whatsoever so we'll get on with what i'm supposed to be talking about um, and in regards to the cell and all that sort of stuff it's a central tube design so the tail comes off but also let's have a look the central tube now i'm presuming in future they may release a slightly different tube or something i don't know but with the 21700 i'm not sure and um, they usually do that with the 18650s um, so central tube there nice design knurling is fine we'll we'll take a look at that there no need to zoom in but absolutely fine like a sort of square squared off design neat no chafing or anything or little bits of scuff and um, lightly lubed and there is a o-ring there now if you notice most of these Chinese lights normally come with a couple of spare O-rings. This didn't. So if you shred these, you're, you're up uh, S Creek, I'll say. Um, I like the nailing on this. It's kind of like the old Clarisses, um, or like a mil an old Mills bomb from World War One. It's a bit deeper, like, like some of the uh, newer O-lights. I really like that. It gives you a decent grip. It's not like some of the really... Uh, more cosmetic on the lumen top that's okay it's slightly grippy you know it's not it's not as good as that though and um, so i really appreciate that and it's certainly not as aggressive as the c8 I, watch the c8 is really aggressive watch see that look it's, it's actually filing my thumb down thumbnail down so that's very aggressive on the c8 you don't need that level of aggressiveness unless you know on a trampoline trying to use a flashlight or something like that so when you want to put this back together just remember silver to the top and I'll give you a quick look at the board there, or the pill, or whatever they want to call it these days. So that's that there, very clean, no issues. And you can see the two little points there. So you've got a little point there, and a little point there, if you want to take that out. But you're going to need a tool to do that. You can do it with some needle nose pliers, if you, but that's not really how you're supposed to do it. Uh, but I didn't take that to bits too much. So very clean looking. That there doesn't actually extend. It's not spring-loaded. It's one solid bit. And yes, people are going to go, ah, he's touching a contact. Yes, I'm doing it at the tip of my nail. Calm down. So that's one solid section there. So let's put this back together. 
quite like the look of it. I don't know why they've picked blue. I don't know whether that's to be a bit like the old lights, but it doesn't matter. Um, it certainly fits in with the light. And I like this sort of curved um, design here. That's certainly not going to work as a heat sink, but you'll be happy to hear the step on, the, on this is pretty decent. So I'll put this in and watch, it just fits, watch. See how it goes down? Boom, just. Um, so there's no room for expansion, so just be aware of that. So I'll put that in, no issues there. And it is a flat bottom there with a section there. It's not a tail clicker, so you can't tail stand it. Though the way they've put this on, which is ridiculous, they've put this on this way, uh, the lanyard, which means that it, it causes an obstruction so it might fall over, if, see, if you put it down too quickly. Um, I don't know why they don't, why they do that. All you need to do is loop it through that. That's why there's two holes there. Loop it through that and not over the top, and then it'll go to the side. But they just they always seem to do that with the convoys, and I don't know why. Okay, so this is a thrower. So let's quickly go over what that is. So it's trying to get light to travel a distance, and I'll show you that. In fact, what I'll do is I'll show you some traditional ones first. So a traditional thrower, you have this deep reflective bowl with the LED or emitter in the bottom there. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get that light to go a distance. So let's see what that looks like. So we'll turn that on. That's disengaged, that's my fault. Right, so we'll turn that on, turn it a bit so you can actually see what's going on here. Okay, so you have this you have this section here, which is your spill, which is light directly from the LED, which is great for sort of um, vision to the side when you're hiking and things like that. But the, the main purpose of this is to make light travel. So the reflected light within that bowl is here. You get this hot spot. So you're trying to get that to travel at a distance. So as I pull back here, you can see the hot spot still remains. That That's what travels distance. The problem is up close, it's a little bit irritating. I haven't even got this on the highest setting. And you see how it's obscure in detail? It's a little bit irritating. It's not designed for close-up work. So the far end of the scale, the other direction, would be something like a TIR, where they don't really care about distance. That's not what they're after. So here's a TIR here. Ignore this here. I'm going to cover that. Here's the TIR. TIR stands for Total Internal Refraction. And what's happening is it's basically a piece of plastic which is diffusing the light. So I'll show you that. Now I think I disengaged this as well because this has been in my pocket. Yeah, so hold that down. That's red light. That's some other mode. And I'll get there eventually. There you go. So can you see how? Let's just quickly compare that. So here's the thrower. That obscures detail but it fires the light a long distance. That light's on there. You can't actually see the beam, can you? It's on. Yes, I, I understand. It's a lower level, but you see how there's, you can't really see a beam profile. It's very diffuse. That's fantastic for up close work. It's beautiful and it's a, it's a, it's a really advantageous thing. However, you're not going to get any distance. So, for example, on this one, they've decided, well, we'll have that for up close work. But then you see how they've used a smooth reflector? So they've got a smooth reflector, which... Yeah, it spreads it out. I mean, it is very wide, this one, in comparison to most of these throwers. But they've gone for that to try and get a bit of distance. And you can see there's something of a hot spot there. It's not as pronounced as the, a dedicated thrower. Now, you could argue, well, okay, well, what's middle of the road? So middle of the road would be, so you've got TIR on this side for close-up work. You've got a thrower on this side, which is maximum distance. So somewhere in the middle, you would have an orange peel reflector. So let's look at that. Looks reflective, but can you see how it's all bumped? See it? It's like an orange peel from uh, Florida or somewhere like that. So you're trying to go for middle of the road. So if I engage this and turn it on, can you see what's happening there? Yes, you've got your spill and you've got your, your hot spot, which you can see there. You can see there is a hot spot. You can see how it's not obscure in detail to the same amount. Yes, there's a spot if I, if I come in close here, but it's trying, to, it's trying to bridge the gap between those two. So it's saying, I'm going to spread it out a bit, but you're not going to get maximum distance. So with all that in mind what is this well by by looking at it you'd think okay well it's a smooth reflector therefore it's going for maximum distance however that's not really the case because look see how it, it almost mimics a orange peel watch put the orange peel on the left here if i can get this turned on turn this on orange peel on the left there and then this one there's a lot of similarities there you see how the the hot spot in the middle the, i mean this is a little bit more diffuse yes but can you see how it's just not as pronounced and that's what I found in testing with this yes it's a dedicated thrower yes it's a smooth reflector going for maximum distance but because of this emitter and what we'll do is hang on I'll get a good shot uh, there you go right try and get a good angle okay if we zoom in there can you see how what they've done to make this emitter it's actually four emitters stuck together under a under a dome see that so this is this is this is just how the 70.2 works. So we'll zoom back out there. 
So it's a bit of a strange emitter. So what you get is you're not going to get the distance on a that you get on a dedicated thrower. However, you're going to get more usable diffuse light to a medium to slightly far range. And I'll show you that in the screenshots later on because I took a lot of beam shots to show this. Um, so if you're looking for a dedicated thrower, this probably isn't the light for you, but it's very interesting in that it bridges the gap between a dedicated thrower and something like a orange peel uh, with a massive output. This uses exactly the same. It's the Cree 70.2 emitter that this uses. However, this is using orange peel. Now, interestingly, I couldn't, uh, trying to find figures of output on this is a nightmare. Um, I did have a look um, and all I can really say is on the Ace Beam, um, I mean, they're quoting something like 4,600 lumens maximum on turbo. On this, it feels like about 3,000 to 3,500, I would say. So I don't think it's outputting to quite the same uh, degree, but it's certainly powerful. So even though it's not a dedicated thrower, it's still pushing that distance. I've done a lot of long range tests and it still holds up well. Um, and it's usable light and it spreads it out a nice amount. So we'll quickly go through some of the uh, specs on this. So Convoy M21E, um, you can get this in black or silver. I went for black. The reason I went for black is because I want to see how long the paint lasts. Well, I say paint, they call it anodization. I mean the coating. Now there's nothing leading me to suggest that this is badly made. It's, it's decent, there was a few little scuffs. It's done remarkably well. Bear in mind this has been in my pocket with keys, with other flashlights, banging around on multiple occasions. Mm, is there a bit of paint coming off there? Tiny little bit there, you see if we zoom in? tiny little bit there but very little okay so we'll, we'll zoom back out there so it did remarkably well very resilient uh, no issues on uh, workmanship there so as i say this is using the cree xhp 70.2 led now it comes in different flavors i went for the 5000 k so we'll explain what that means so you can get it in three th in fact we'll bring up a little thing at the bottom here there you go Okay, so this comes in at 3000K, 4000K, 5000K or 6500K. So what am I talking about today? Well, I'm talking about the tint, as we call it in the flashlight world. Even though I had a photographer on one of my other reviews saying, it's not, that's not what tint means. Well, it does in the flashlight world, so sorry about that. So in regards tint, so down the far end of this scale here, you have the lower end of the Kelvin. So Kelvin is a description of color temperature. So right to, uh, on the 3000 level, it's very, very sort of yellowy um, or very warm as other people would call it. And then at the far end of the scale up here, which is 6,500, which you can get this in, this is very white, so cool white. So what's going on there? Well, if you want a whiter looking light, you go for the 6,500K. If you want a very warm, pleasant, uh, light you go for the 3000k. I would say 4500 is about neutral in other words like sunlight um, Not passing through clouds on earth when it hits the ground. So similar to sunlight uh, Whereas some people prefer a cool white because it looks better. The problem with that is on a throw you can sometimes get some backscatter and uh, Sometimes it can be a little bit glaring on reflective surfaces or wet surfaces, but it's not, it's not a major deal breaker for me and you need to pick the tint that you prefer. Okay, so let's get rid of that scale there. There you go, bang, right. Okay, so like I say, um, you're, you're probably gonna get up to about, close to about sort of 3,500 to 4,000 lumens easily. It certainly doesn't seem to be going up to the levels of the Ace Beam at 4,600. Um, it's very difficult for me to sort of test that. I, I, could, I was only able to test that by looking at it in comparison to other lights and that that's what I came to in regards to other tests and we'll move this down so and put some stats up so in regards to the other tests I did I had, I had a look at it through my battery of special trail trek tests and what I realized was that during my testing on multiple occasions um, I tried it over a few different days with different batteries the CRI rating I got was 70. So that's not bad. That's about right for the Cree um, XHP stuff. So 70 means it's it's an okay representation of the full color gamut that you would normally get with natural light. In other words, from the sun. So natural sunlight gives you 100% color reproduction index, whereas 70 means you're missing out on some of the finer um, gradation and color detail. Um, it just means it doesn't look as lifelike. Is it a deal breaker? Probably not. Although there will be people, and especially tint stops, and people who say, well, no, you need 90% CRI. Yes, it's preferable and it's nicer, but at this price, I'm not gonna complain too much. I also tested the tint, and it was a bit of a strange one, this, because there is some tint shift on this, so I had to test about 10 different times um, and different angles and what have you, and what I came up with um, 
was the tint came out for me. In other words, the Kelvin figure as 5,103. That was as an average of, I think it was 10 readings I took in total over two days. Um, so it's about on par. So it's, it's very close to the 5,000 that they're quoting. So I had no problems with that. And I quite like the tint. Um, it's pretty good. Like I say, there is some tint shift. So it's, it's almost cool at certain angles and on certain things. It can look cool white and then you get a bit of yellow. Then it goes back to cooler... That's just an artifact of this emitter, but as you come back, that, that tends to rectify itself. And if you're out and about, you're going to notice that left. But I just want to point out, there is some tin shift and you can see it. Okay. Okay. So not bad, not bad um, in regards to statistics. I was I was quite happy. So like I say, it uses the 21700. I've shown you the cell I put in here. A nice uh, battery size for a good capacity, 4200 milliamp hours on the cell that I tried it with. So that's great. So you're getting more capacity than something that you would have on like this with an 18650. Yes, it's a smaller cell, um, but this certainly isn't more pocketable because the bowl's bigger um, and you get less capacity. This is a wrap over a uh, 30Q from Samsung, which only provides around 3000 milliamp hours. So you're getting substantially more on this cell, which I like. Uh, it means you, you don't have to think ahead too much. Okay, so there is charging on this. So on the back, you have a flap. Now, if you take the flap open, you notice it's hurry, type C instead of the old fashioned micro USB. Now, the first problem is, look, you can't twiddle that out the way. Even if you twiddle it out the way, look, you see what that you would normally do, it still sort of goes in the way of the... It, I don't like this flap very much. It's one of the one of the poorer flaps, and I don't like the ones where they stretch like this because there comes a point where that, see that there? That snaps, and it's just a matter of time if you're regularly charging. I don't like this flap, and I don't like the implementation of it, unfortunately, but it's, it is what it is, but I'm going to slightly mark it down for that. So we'll, we'll, we'll test that at charger. So I'm going to use my trusty XTAR here. So let's start with a yeah, type A to type C. So what probably what most people have. So we'll plug that in there, type A, and then we'll take the type C, which is any directional, doesn't matter. And as you can see, you've got to kind of hold it out the way. Or if you try and do it like that, it gets in the way, you see. You can't push it in, you've got to like hold it out the way and it pulls on that. I, I don't like the flap. So let's get that plugged in. There, it's charging red and then it goes green when it's finished. So if we'll have a look, if you ignore this figure here, it charges at about five volts. It's a very rapid charger, this one, which it should be for the big cells that it's using. So uh, in my testing, I got between zero, I think it was 1.4 of an amp, and it, it peaked at 1.6, slightly fluctuated up to 1.7, um, but you're gonna get about one and a half amps, so very rapid charging for an onboard charger. I was very happy about that because it's the, the larger capacity cell, so no problems with that. Um, it also worked with uh, Type-C to Type-C, in other words, power delivery, because not all manufacturers implement that. So we'll try that. So here's a type C to type C. So we'll plug it in and then we'll plug it in here. And like I say, you've got to hold it out of the way. It's irritating. So there you go. Charging again, you see red. Now, if you notice that's slightly less there, it pumps up there. So it says 4.8, it's about five volts. And then 1.2, it's slightly less than now because it's, the battery is virtually full. So 1.2 went out there, but it does work. You see type C to type C. I had no problems with that. So we'll take that off and put that there. So like I say, marks down for that flap. I'm not a fan, but you know, it is what it is. And that's just one of the things you've got to put up with. Okay, so we've got that there. Um, like I say, smooth reflector had no problems with it, charges pretty fast, you're looking at around 1.5 amps, I was pretty happy with that. So I wanna talk about the button before we go on to the UI. I'm not a fan of the button, it's too small and it's not very responsive, it's pretty, it's, it's a hard clicker. Now you're probably thinking, who cares, just come on, put some masculinity into it and press harder. Yes, you can do that, however, when you're out and you're really cold, and not all, not many people might know this, and some will, especially people who are in the military and people who work outdoors, the longer you're out in the cold, the the further your, your, your blood supply retreats from your periphery. What then happens is it slows down your digits. So what happens is if you've got a slightly unresponsive button or it takes a lot of travel, it becomes difficult to your, your fine motor skills reduce and your speed reduces whether you like it or not so and i'm not just talking about you know me being an idiot here this is what happens so i found certain functions irritating so for example to lock this 
this isn't a joke, you've got to press it 10 times. So if I wanted to lock this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Right, still with me? Bang, right, that should be locked. No, it isn't, right, I'll do it again. If you don't do it just right, I found this a little bit annoying. So I'm not a fan of the button. Yes, I did get used to it after about a week. I got used to it and I was really pushing it home. But I just thought, do I really need this? There's plenty of other lights with really nice buttons. Um, and one of my favorites still with a recess, no, this doesn't have a recess. You know, just give it a recess like this so it doesn't get knocked. This is a beautiful button, dead responsive, feels nice, beautiful tactile. I don't know why they couldn't just do that. It feels like they've, they've knocked this together and they've done an okay job, I like the light, but there's a few things I would change. The flap needs changing and the button, I just, I like the pattern on it. It's got like a sort of knurling and I like this ring, which is red um, when it's charging and green and all, but I just think they could have done it a bit better. It's a bit irritating, um, but we'll go over the UI because it's a quite, a, well, I say it's a straightforward one. It's a straightforward one uh, for a flashaholic like us. Okay, so, so UI. So in regards to UI, it's not too bad. Um, so you've got one click is on and off and it is memory mode. So it will remember the last mode that you were in. So if you click that, it's thinking, right, what, what mode was I last in? Which is brilliant. So it's gonna go straight back to wherever you were on the ramping, or it does have a stepped mode, but we'll go over that. So it's gonna remember that. Big time saver there, so you're not having to ramp every time. So that's your basic function. If you click and hold from off, so make sure it's off and click and hold, it should take it to moonlight. So we'll just double check that. So click and hold, moonlight. That should be its lowest possible setting. I think that was a little bit too high. Um, they're quoting on their literature, which I found online because they didn't bother putting a manual in. Um, uh, it should be 0.2% of its maximum theoretical output. I would prefer to have seen that a little bit lower, although it was nice to use that as a quick setting for um, if you want to walk but don't want to let people know you're there. Um, it was okay for that sort of setting, but I certainly wouldn't want to read a map by this. Look, you're really going to ruin your night vision. It's too high. Um, I would have preferred to have seen like a one lumen, something like that, but never mind. Um, now, here's the first problem. So that's the lowest possible setting. So you're probably thinking, well, this is a rampant one, so you'll just press the button and, and go up. No, you can't. See? Listen, I'm pressing the button. Nothing's happening. So let's discuss what's happening there. Click and hold takes it to its lowest output. You can't then press the button and ramp up. You've got to come out of that mode, then go back in at its lowest ramping, then a hold. So I'm not happy about that. So if you just click it, that takes it to its lowest ramping setting, not the lowest possible, the lowest ramping setting. So now if you click and hold, see how it ramps up? And then you can click and it'll ramp down. I don't know why they've chosen to do that in the UI. It's a very strange and confusing I would like to see them revise that. I don't understand why you would do that. Maybe it's for tactical reasons, but we're not in a tactical mode, so I don't know why they've done that, but they have. So click and hold from off, takes to its lowest setting, but then you need to come out of that, turn it back on, then you're in normal ramp, and then you can ramp up and down, which is weird. So click. Right, we're into its main mode here, so let's ramp this up. So if you click and hold, it ramps up. It's got a bit of a strange ramp, then it, then it flickers. That tells you where it's, that's its maximum output. And then if you click and hold, It'll ramp down to its lowest output in ramping. So that's its lowest output there. So a bit strange on the UI, but it's basic ramping works. I think the flick is too long. Um, it should just be intermittent. It could maybe be half that speed. I know I'm p being picky here, but I have to. Um, and I don't understand the speed of the ramp. It seems to go, instead of being like a, a, cur like a curve like this, it's sort of like... It, it it goes quickly to the midway, then it hovers about a bit, then it slows down a bit. It, it doesn't feel intuitive, but it works. But I just don't understand why the ramping's like that, but it is. Okay, so what's double click then? Okay, well, we'll just ramp, ramp this all the way down just to make sure we're on a lower level there, just so memory mode doesn't come into play. So if we double click, bang, there, turbo, that's its maximum output straight at the top of the ramp there. So very, very bright, I can feel that in my hand. There's a lot of heat there. Um, in regards to heat and step down, I couldn't get this to step down, although I've been out in very cold weather. Um, it was you know three to four degrees or lower and with mist in the air. But very, that's producing a lot of heat out the front, but it's doing a good job in regards here. Look, that's on turbo, I'm holding it, no problems whatsoever. It's not excessive in the heat. In fact, it's very similar to the Ace Beam E70 in that um, step down was something like three minutes. I think it was about two and a half to three minutes on this one if I just stood there for ages in the dark. It did it eventually, but 
you, in most uses, you're not going to get that. So brilliant to see. You're getting a high output, but it's not ramping down rapidly. And heat, look, no problems with heat because of this large area. I was a bit suspect when I saw this. I thought, well, where's the heat sinks? It doesn't really need it. Even on its high settings, it doesn't step down for a long time. So very, very happy about that. Okay, so there's a triple click, which is strobe. So one, two, three, there. I'll cover that because I don't want to annoy people with epilepsy and things. So there, there's your um, strobe, and it's using maximum output on and off. Um, that's it, that's it. You can't change the frequency like you can in Angular or anything like that. So let's turn that off. Handy to have, and you can quickly get to it. I appreciate that, that's fine. Okay, and you can ramp up and down. Now there is a four click mode, so one, two, three, four. There. So there's a bit of a flash there. So now this is tactical. So it's either on or it's off. So you press it, you can hold it on and let go. You can't turn it on. You've got to hold and it's on and then off. So one, two, ooh, hang on. See, see what I mean about the button? One, two, three, four. There. Right, it's back to normal. I can ramp it again. There, it's ramping. Okay, so you also have a voltage check, which is five clicks. So one, two, three, four, five. So if you watch, what this will do is this will flash out um, the capacity of the battery here. So we'll wait until this starts again. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, four. Right, so, right, what's happening there is normally you would have, it would flash out one, two, three, four, and then it would flash out the figure after that. So, for example, if this cell was at 4.1, it would see, it would flash one, two, three, four, slight pause, then it would flash again to say one, so you would say 4.1. It's only flashing four times here because this is at a straight four volts. So four volts, in other words, full capacity would be 4.2 on this. So it's slightly dropped. I did use this um, this morning in the, gar in the garage and things like that, but it, it's accurate enough. Um, and for us flashaholics, we like the voltage um, rather than a percentage because um, we, we we just like that. That's fine. I would have preferred to have seen it alterable to a percentage for non-flashaholics, but okay. It's not. It's not certainly not the end of the world, and it does seem to work. Now you've got six clicks. So one, two, three, four, five, six. But I'll do that again. You see what I mean about this button? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So that should change between ramp and step. So if we're click and hold now you see how it goes up in steps and it should cycle so low up 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 and then back to its lowest again so you can have stepped where you've got known steps so what's the point of that well the point of that is you can memorize how long the battery would last at certain steps and it helps you organize what it is you're doing if you want to turn that back off turn it off and then one two three four five six hopefully that should be back to ramping so we'll just check that. Yes, back to ramping. So that does work. And then there is locked. So let's see if I actually get locked to work this time. So one, two, three, four, see, not nah, too slow. Right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right. Now it's locked. Okay. So if you press the button, you just get a momentary flash and nothing else. Watch. There. Momentary flash, nothing else. So to turn that back off, one, two, three, four, five, six. No, nah, I wasn't quick enough. Right. So we'll try that again. So turn that off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right, I think that's on. Yeah, that's working. Okay, so that's your UI. A bit irritating. A few things I would change, um, especially going from its lowest moon mode and then you can't ramp up. You've got to come out and go back in and all that. I don't, I'm not a fan of that, so I will mark them down for that. I've got to be picky, so it's, an, it's a nice light and I had fun using it, but these are all, all these little things add together to become a bit of a nuisance. Okay, so let's talk about good points and bad points, and then I'll show you some of the lights that I compared it to, and then what we'll do is we'll talk about beams. Okay, so good. It has a lockout, even though it's, you know, ridiculous. Two hours later, right, I'm in lock mode, you know. Too many clicks for a lockout, I'm sorry, but it does have a lockout. It works whilst charging, so whilst you're charging this, you can still use it. I like that function. It allows you to use the light in camps and things like that, and you can charge it when you're camping and things like that, and it, it allows other uses, like, you know, table lamps and things. It's very useful. Um, you can seal and bounce if you take this off and put it on properly, which is nice, and you could plug that in and use it. It's Type-C, which I really appreciate, and it's power delivery, so you don't have to worry about that if you've got a Type-C to Type-C. Um, it's got very high output, not quite as high, I would say, as the... Um, the E70 from Ace Beam, even though it's exactly the same emitter, they both use the 70.2. Um, but it's enough, um, and it certainly didn't, it wasn't so much that it steps down every five minutes and burns your fingers, so that was nice to see. Um, it's not too big, 
especially bearing in mind it's a thrower and um, it was manageable in all, all the pockets that I used it in and um, it's got a long step down turbos okay uh, includes a voltage check which is nice it's nice to see that so you can tell what the battery's doing because you know you don't have to be a mind reader but in regards to bad UI we had 10 clicks for a lock and you can't ramp up from one mode to the other and the ramping feels a bit janky um, but it's usable, I'm being fair here, it is usable and I enjoy using it, but I'm, I'm picking on these tiny little things because this is to help people who might want to buy this. It's got ramping interface, which is a, I appreciate that, it's a, it's, a nice, it's a nice way to interact with the light, you can see exactly what's happening, you ramp up, you ramp down, dead simple. The button, um, not a fan of, like I say, I don't know what it is, I think it's because it's too small, the hole's too small, you've got to be right over it, it's, got, it's quite stiff. I don't know what to make of that. I think they need to change that. I would like this to be recessed, get a decent button like you get on the Astro Luxes or something. Um, I just, I'm not a fan of the button. Um, flap, daft, you've got to hold it out of the way, it gets in the way, and I think that's gonna end up snapping. Flaps, I'm not a big fan of anyway. Yes, they do work when they're implemented right, but not a big fan of this one. You get tint shift, uh, which I've shown you. You know, you've got like a white bit, then a yellowy bit then, but that's just an artifact of this emitter. It's got to live with that and the 10 click for lock, annoying. So we'll look at some beams and then I'll show you the other lights that we'll look at. So in fact, let, let's bring up a picture here. Okay. So here's some of the lights that I tested it against. So I used the ASBeam beam E70, which also uses the same emitter. It also has the 70.2. Um, uh, the Astrolux FT02, which uses four in a, f in a smooth reflector, but it's sort of like, f it's a quarter meter, but it's only using the 50.2, so you still get a floody beam. And then the Astrolux FT03, large bowl, dedicated thrower. Um, that's using the SST40, I think, um, which is really a dedicated throwing uh, LED. And then the Lumen, uh, Lumen Top GT Mini, which is a dedicated thrower using an 18650 and the older X XHPs or whatever the hell they're called, so around a thousand-ish lumens. And then far right, you've got the Convoy C8 Plus, which is like a budget version of the Lumen Top GT Mini. Same, same emitter, um, slightly different um, setup though, but same sort of output, same battery and what have you. So right in the middle at the bottom there, Convoy M21E, which is what we're testing. So what can we say? Well, let's look first off at beam sort of profile. So if you look at the Lumen Top GT Mini and the Convoy C8 Plus, so that's the left and the right at the bottom there, and compare that to the convoy which we're looking at you'll see that um, they're dedicated throwers therefore you don't get peripheral light in other words to the far left and the far right of the frame you don't see anything because it's not it's not wasting light by spreading it out there it's trying to fire at a distance and in in that regards you'll notice that the hot spot is very obvious and you can see the blue beam of light there you can see the same from the astrolux FT03 as well. That also has the, the same sort of look. You can't see far left or right, and you've got this intense hotspot. That hotspot is trying to fire a distance. So let's put that into some sort of context. So what are they doing that the convoy isn't doing? Well, you can see the convoy, for whatever reason, do, is not, doesn't have that intense hotspot. So what's happening there? Well, it's taking that light and it's stretching it out a bit, so you get more of a floody beam, even though it's a thrower. So very interesting, and in fact, if you compare that to the ace beam, which uses an orange peel reflector, totally different. So the ace beam top left there, it's very interesting to say that the, the ace beam is definitely more uniform and it's very hard to discern where the hotspot is. Um, it doesn't really have much of a hotspot, but you can see that the ace beam on its orange peel, you can see far left and far right, you can see the trees, whereas you can't on the Convoy M21E because it is a thrower, although it's slightly wider than the dedicated throwers. So very interesting. And in regards to the Astrolux FT02S, um, that's using four emitters, that's very floody, and you can see far left, far right. Um, but you can see a tiny little bit of the blue beam there spreading out. So very interesting. In regards to tints and things like that, you can see that the Lumatop GT Mini has the warmest tint. Um, and the Convoy M21E, which we're looking at, quite interesting. I mean, like I say, I went for the 5000K, that's what it says in the box, that's what arrived. It feels around that, although it's kind of confusing because of that tint shift. So in the middle you get a little bit of sort of cool whitiness, then you get a yellowness, then you get a sort of a strange flood. So there is tint shift and I just want to mention that. 
but as you can see, Ashlux FT03, Convoy C8 Plus and Lumen Top GT Mini, dedicated throwers, you can see that beam, you can see that hotspot, it's certainly pushing out. But you could argue at medium range, the Convoy M21E is better. Um, it's better in that, in medium range, it's showing more in the distance. So if we look at what it's looking at in the distance, you can see a walkway there, you can see the, the cliff in the distance, whereas on the other ones, you can just see a very small portion of that. But that's an artifact of a thrower, that's what you get. What do you want? Do you want something more floody or do you want more distance? You can't have both. So that's what they've gone for on this M21E. So it looks like a dedicated thrower, but it really isn't. Okay, so let's get rid of that picture there. Okay, so there's the picture gone. So like I say, very interesting. It's not a dedicated thrower, even though it looks like one, and it has the credentials of one in that it has the large smooth bowl. So very interesting. But I would argue that this is probably better for, um, you know, medium range, uh, it's not a good close-up for walking, but you can use it. It's not designed for that. It, it, it seems to excel at medium range when you ramp it up. That would, that would be, that's what I would say. If you're looking for a medium range thrower, get this. It's, it's certainly decent. If you can put up with all those UI issues and flaps and daft buttons and things. Okay, so let's give this a mark out of 10. I want to be fair because I enjoyed using this. I liked it because it was nice high output. I um, like the ace beam using the same emitter. Um, I mean, I tested it against the old C8, same company, Convoy, the C8 Plus and the Lumen Top GT Mini, which is here. And obviously these are dedicated throwers. This was more pleasant to use for walking. This was more of a dedicated throw, but then you're getting this tiny little bit of usable light. So is that what, if you want maximum distance, you may want to go for one of these. If you want something more usable, this is better. And um, the Ace Beam costs way more than this, way more than this. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm not really gonna make a, a massive comparison. The only reason I made the comparison is because they use the same emitter. Um, if you want something, a proper large dedicated throw, but look at the size this difference. Massive difference in size there. Um, you're certainly not gonna get that in many pockets unless you're a clown and you've got huge clown trousers or something like that. Uh, um, so very, very large. Look, it doesn't even fit in the frame there. The other one that I compared it to, which is also floody, um, and it's using, a, it's a quarter meter, so you've got four 50.2s down there. Um, quite an interesting light, I like the button on this. Um, decent. Um, never had any problems with this. This has a better flap and everything, but this is by Astrolux. Um, you may want to push for that, but it's bigger, look. See, a lot bigger in the pocket, heavier as well, whereas this is sensible and it doesn't step down too quickly. So get them out of the way. I'm going to have to give this a mark. Come on, Trail Trek. Okay, so if I had to give this a mark, bearing in mind it's got a lot of things I like, but UI, button and flap annoy me. I'm going to give it... God, this is very difficult, very, very difficult. Uh, if I'm being honest, I'm going to have to give it a 7.5. I want it to change the button, change the UI, change the flap. What else? Put this lanyard on properly, but you know, that's, you can change that yourself. Um, I should give it an 8 because that's, that's, I'm being too picky because these aren't deal breakers. I'll, I'll give it an 8. 8 because these things aren't deal breakers. That didn't make me hate it. I enjoyed using this light, yeah. I enjoyed using this light. Eight out of ten, I think they need to make changes though. And it would make this so much better. And you could call this something like a really beautiful mid-range thrower. And it, it really is nice in that in that regard. I enjoyed using it, yeah. Eight out of ten. I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm being honest. Um, so enough of me waffling. Let's get outside. I've taken loads of range tests and beam shots and things and comparisons. I'll put them all side by side to show you. So enough of me waffling. Let's get outside. So eight out of ten. Come on, convoy. Make some changes and release a V2. Right. Goodbye. Whee!